I find it refreshing to know that, uh, Thad, you were preaching or teaching on prayer this morning. The choir's singing about prayer and Matt's preaching about prayer. So God works behind the scenes. Uh, we didn't know any of that before today. Uh, and God is always orchestrating uh, not only uh, worship, but uh, ministry. And uh, he, he, through the power of the Holy Spirit, impresses on us uh, what we are to say and do and teach and sing. And I'm just so blessed this morning to, to be a part of that. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from Acts chapter 2. I'll be reading verses 14 through 21. But let me encourage you to go home and read all of chapters 1 and 2. And ask God to give you wisdom and understanding so you can understand what God's word is, is telling you in these days. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's a promise. That's a promise that we have in God's word that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, in the first chapter, Jesus told his disciples, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father has promised. And I'm going to deliver that gift to you. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And after this, Jesus was taken away before their very eyes, and a cloud hid Jesus from their sight. So the disciples left this place and, and returned to Jerusalem and went into the upper room along with the other disciples and devoted themselves to prayer. Then on the day of Pentecost, the disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit. Now who is the Holy Spirit? Well, the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. The Bible says He is another counselor and the Spirit of truth. He is God who lives in us engages us, inspires us, guides us, and empowers us. The Bible also says, until the day he was taken up to heaven, Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, instructed the apostles. If the glorified and resurrected Jesus relied on the Holy Spirit, how much more do we need to rely on the Holy Spirit in our lives? And after Pentecost, we see this in the disciples because they did not attempt to do the work of the church without the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit guiding them and empowering them and helping them to answer the call that God had placed on their lives. In fact, the Holy Spirit did a great and significant work through them. Good friends, we cannot do the work of the church without the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, as Christians, we believe that the Holy Spirit is God with us and lives in the heart of every believer. We believe that the Holy Spirit comforts us when we are in need and convicts us when we stray from God. We believe that the Holy Spirit awakens us to God's will and empowers us to live obediently to God's will. The Holy Spirit is God's present activity in the midst of his people. When we sense God's leading, God's challenge, God's support, or, or God's comfort, we say that is the work of the Holy Spirit. And as disciples, we ought to be praying just like the disciples did back 2,000 years ago. And as these disciples were praying, suddenly from heaven there came the sound like the rush of a mighty wind. 
And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. And when this sound was heard, a large crowd gathered outside the home where the disciples had been praying. And the disciples began to speak in tongues as the Holy Spirit enabled them. And the people were amazed and perplexed because they heard the disciples declaring the wonders of God in their own language. Now this is people from all over the region, from other nations coming to Jerusalem during the Shabbat, during this festival of weeks. This was one of the seven feasts and festivals rather that, that people had to come to. It was one of those, we, we need to travel, we need to go to Jerusalem. And three of the festivals, you know, you were, you were encouraged to come back to Jerusalem. And this was one of those festivals that they were coming to. And so they were gathered outside this home because they heard this loud sound, they were confused. And then all of a sudden they hear the apostles declaring the glories and the wonders of God in a language they could understand. But then there were others who gathered who began to make fun of these disciples because they thought they were drunk on wine. So Peter addresses the crowd and after he had finished speaking about Jesus and declaring that Jesus is not only Lord but Christ, the people were cut to the heart and they asked Peter, what shall we do? And Peter tells them the first step is to repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ so that you may have your sins forgiven and that you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's the first step for every person who wants to be a follower of Jesus. But the question still remains, what shall we do? Because we don't stop there. So what shall we do? As the New Testament shows us, from that time on, the early Christians were vividly aware of God's Spirit leading the church. And in the book of Acts, we see the early church being deployed as they put into practice and lived out the commands that Jesus had given them. That's what the church still is supposed to be doing today. That we are supposed to practice and live out the commands that Jesus has given us in the New Testament. And I believe that, that God wants to deploy us. I believe that God wants us to experience His Holy Spirit leading His church so that we can live through the power and the presence and the influence of the Holy Spirit in these days. But before we can be deployed, we must understand our mission. So this morning we're going to look at three very important questions. The first question is this, what is the mission of God? And then we'll look at how we can accomplish the mission. And then we'll look at how do we prepare ourselves for the mission. So what is the mission of God? Well, the primary mission of God is to be a witness for Jesus Christ. That's what Jesus told us. You will be my witnesses. So what is a witness? A witness is a person who testifies about the things they have personally experienced and have personal knowledge in. If you are called to be a witness in the court of law, the judge will instruct you, tell us what you saw and what you heard. Nothing more. Just what you saw and what you heard. And it's interesting to note that the Greek word that we translate witness in the English language has the same root word from, when, from which we get the word martyr. This is a reminder that it may cost you to be a witness for Christ. It may cost you a relationship with someone. It may cost you uh, your job. When we were serving down at, at uh, Enterprise at uh, Heritage United Methodist Church, there was a young lady who was a, a believer, who was a, a worshiper, uh, who followed Christ, and her whole family stayed at home. And her family, every chance they had to ridicule her, ridiculed her. But she kept believing that Jesus had called her to be the person that she was and, and to continue to worship Him and, and continue to, to be all that God had created her to be. Her family basically disowned her, but she kept worshiping the Lord. The early church certainly understood this truth. They suffered intense persecution. Many of them were in prison and some were even executed because of their faith. Yet they remained faithful witnesses to the Lord. And God expects nothing less from us. 
We are to be faithful witnesses of the Lord Jesus Christ in this world and in these days. And as witnesses, what are we to testify about? Well, after Jesus encountered the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, he appeared to all his disciples and told them repentance for the forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning at Jerusalem. And this is what we see happening on the day of Pentecost. These 12 disciples standing together with Peter as he addresses the crowd. Now think about that for a second. All 12 disciples, Matthias was elected, you know, to replace Judas Iscariot, right? And so all 12 of these disciples stand up. And Peter, being filled with the Holy Spirit as well, just began to speak and began to preach to this crowd who had gathered to hear what was going on. And Peter's message and ours is still very simple. Christ died on the cross to pay for the penalty of our sins. And all who repent of those sins and replace their faith in Jesus will be forgiven and given the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's it. It really is that simple. We try to complicate the gospel sometimes, but it's not that complicated. It's the simple message that you heard at some point in your life. It's the simple message that you believed. It's the simple message that saved you and changed your life forever. It's the simple message that we are to share with everyone we meet who does not know Christ. It's like one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. And Jesus is the bread of life. And there are people who need to know where they can find that bread. And being an effective, and being an effective witness is both intentional and it's a lifestyle. Jesus said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And here in this passage from Matthew, Jesus gave the church the master plan to make disciples of all people from all nations. We talked about this last week. That's plan A and there is no plan B. This is the master plan that we are to follow. And notice that Jesus' first command is to go. Being an effective witness requires us to put into action our faith. It requires us to make the necessary effort to carry the message to those who need to hear it most. And it requires work to teach new believers how to serve God and how to serve each other. We dedicate our lives and we become effective witnesses because of all that Christ has done for us. And let me bring it a little closer to home, but you... You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be witnesses in Wetumpka and Elmore County and Alabama and to the ends of the earth. You will be the witnesses that God has called in these days. Being a witness starts right where you live and then you move out from there and you don't miss anyone. Secondly, how can we accomplish the mission? We can only accomplish the mission by the power of God. Jesus told his followers that they would receive power when the Holy Spirit came upon them. They would be empowered when they were directly connected to the Holy Spirit. Christ made it clear that the Holy Spirit is our power source. The Greek word for power is dunamis. It means mighty work, strength, and miracle. It's the same Greek word that we get words like dynamic and, and dynamo and dynamite. When you engage with the Holy Spirit, you are connected to the same power that created the universe and all that's in it. You are connected to the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. That's the power that you are connected to when you give your life to Christ and the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And why do we need the power of God? Because we're weak. We're fallen. We can't do it on our own. The simple truth is we cannot do the work of God in our own strength, although sometimes we try. And Jesus told his disciples, apart from me, you can do nothing. We have to be connected to the vine. We have to be connected to the power of God. We are powerless when we are not connected to Jesus. We see this in Peter. After he was forgiven and restored by Jesus on the beach at the fish fry, The Holy Spirit empowered him to become a powerful and dynamic speaker. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. 
We need the power of the Holy Spirit. And the first step to being filled with God's power is to realize how weak and powerless we are without him. And understand just how necessary his power is to us. Because people are dying without knowing Jesus. And they're doing it all around us. In our society, sin is out of control because people have turned their backs on God. But with God's help and with God's power, we can introduce people to Jesus. And Jesus can turn their lives around. Paul told the church in Rome, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Even in our weakness, God can make us strong through the power of the Holy Spirit. There is no limit to the power of Almighty God. He has the ability to do whatever he needs done. God is able to do above and beyond all the things that we can ask for or think about according to the power that is at work within us. We need the power of God working in us and through us if we expect to effectively accomplish the mission of God. And lastly, how do we prepare for the mission? We prepare for the mission by being united in prayer. You know as well as I do that over the last couple of months, over the last couple of years, we've seen the power of prayer at work in our church. There's a miracle sitting right over there in the choir. Tammy was in the hospital for 75 days last year at UAB, and because of the prayers that were lifted up for her, she came out of that. Not many people who, who have a blood infection that attacks the heart come through that. But we've seen, Miss Diane is right there. She was in a horrific car wreck. And and through the power of prayer, she's getting better. She's being restored. And and many of you know example after example of how God has been working in our lives and in our church as we have come together and prayed together and lifted up these people to the Spirit of God. And He is moving mightily in their lives. Unity and prayer are two of the most powerful things tools that God gives to his people. And when they are combined, the power of the church is magnified. If there is to be power in the church, then we must first have unity. Paul urged the other church to make every effort to keep the the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace that binds us together. Where the peace and the presence of God resides, there is unity in that place. We have to be united with the same understanding and the same conviction. If we want to experience the power of God in our church, and then we must practice Christian unity. One of the main reasons that we put our mission statement in in the bulletin is to let everyone know who we are and what we are about. We have certain values and convictions that are non-negotiable. We are to worship passionately. We are to love extravagantly. And we are to witness boldly. And our vision for our church is to grow spiritually, to grow numerically, and to make a greater impact in our community. That's who we are. And we're not going to walk away from that. We're not going to resign from that. We're going to continue to believe God's holy word. We're going to continue to be people who not only hear it and proclaim it, but believe it. And we're not going to compromise. We must be united about our beliefs and our convictions. And if we want to experience God's power in the church, then we must also have a committed prayer life. We need to be on our knees more. We need to set aside time during our day to get on our knees, to humble our hearts before Almighty God, and to spend time in prayer praying for the people that are on our prayer list, praying for the people you know in your life that don't know Jesus, praying for our church, praying for our leaders, praying for our community. We need to spend more time praying together and be committed to that prayer life. When people, when God's people, dedicate themselves to sincere prayer, all things are possible. Jesus said, therefore, I tell you, all the things you pray and ask for, believe that you have received them and you will have them. Prayer is is vitally important. It's how we communicate with God. But belief is the vehicle that brings the answer of, of those prayers to us. 
James said that the prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. Our prayers matter. Praying together matters. Being committed to a, a prayer life matters. What do you think would happen if we were truly committed to the power of prayer? Could the same thing that happened 2,000 years ago happen again right here and right now? The disciples had seen the power of God flow through Jesus for three years and now the disciples are seeing the power of God flowing through their life. They were in the upper room all joined together constantly in prayer when they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And now we see Peter boldly proclaiming the message of Christ and 3,000 were added to their number that day. I wonder what would happen if we all joined together in prayer. If you flip over a couple of pages and get to chapter 4, you'll begin to see where Peter is brought before the Sanhedrin. And he, he tells the Sanhedrin exactly what the truth is. He tells the Sanhedrin that Jesus, the one you crucified, is Lord and he is Christ. And they release him and he goes back to his own people and they begin to pray again and they raise their voices together in prayer. And then listen to what it says in verse 31 of chapter 4. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. What if that happened here? What if that happened now? I believe there'd be some folks getting right with God, don't you? But I also believe that they would begin to speak boldly about the power of God like never before. Larry Mann sent me a text Friday afternoon while I was working on this sermon. And this is what he said after his wife Connie had been moved to the rehab facility. Prayer's working. She's awake, trying to feed herself. Unbelievable what happened in one day. Keep praying. Your prayers matter. Our prayers matter. We have to have a committed prayer life as a church if we want to see the power of God being unleashed in our lives and in our church. That's the kind of power God wants to unleash within our church and in your life. It's God's desire that we receive all the power necessary to carry out his mission in the world today. But we must prepare ourselves by practicing unity and dedicating ourselves to devout prayer. My last three questions are simple. Are you ready to be deployed on God's mission? Are you ready to be the witnesses that Jesus called you to be? And are you ready to embrace the power of God to accomplish that mission? This morning, let's dedicate ourselves to the work of God, to unity and prayer so that we can be filled with the power of God and accomplish the mission of God, the mission that he has given us for these days. And I believe with all my heart, if we will do this, God will begin to move powerfully in our church and in our lives. And we'll, be see, we'll begin to see lives changed. We'll begin to see the Holy Spirit manifest in our church and in our lives. And we'll begin to see people coming to Christ. That's who we are. That's who we're called to be as a church. Let's pray this morning. Loving Father, gracious God, thank you for the power that you have given us. Help us to connect ourselves to that power. Help us to stay connected to that power. Help us to be the witnesses that you have created us to be. Lord, help us to be prayer warriors. Lord, help us to, to work together in unity. Help us to continue to believe that you are going to move and in our lives and in the life of our church because of the prayers that we're going to lift up and help us to believe that we can embrace this power from on high and accomplish the mission that you have given us to accomplish. And we pray all this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Now maybe this morning you need to ask God to forgive you for not being 
committed to a prayer life or maybe you need to increase your prayer life. Maybe you haven't been as connected to Jesus as you needed to be to be connected to that power. And I believe that if you ask Jesus this morning to reconnect you to that power, to rededicate your life to being committed to prayer, devout prayer, I believe he'll answer that call. He'll answer your prayer and he'll help us to together accomplish the mission that he's given us. Amen.